It was all an illusion. A frame-up, as they say on my planet. Hey, what's up, world? I was going to do a video about the Joe Rogan and Mark Zuckerberg interview. I was basically going to show how the purpose of this interview was to bring confidence back to Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook's stock, it's been in the decline pretty hard over the last couple of months. And that's because people are just no longer interested in these censorship platforms. And honestly, if you ask me, I think that people aren't really interested in these artificial platforms at all. I think that this was largely a trend that is dying down. And of course, not only is it a trend that's dying down, but people just really don't enjoy having their speech censored. They don't really enjoy going on a platform, which is then going to censor them left and right. It's like these platforms have basically been turned into prisons, and people don't really like to spend time in prison. They prefer to spend time in the real world. But anyway, the purpose of that interview was very simply to make Mark Zuckerberg look good. And that's why Mark Zuckerberg, he was like, oh, Facebook didn't want to censor your speech. It didn't want to censor the Hunter Biden laptop story. The FBI asked Facebook to, and we felt the need to listen to the FBI because we believed, and we still believe, that the FBI is a corruption-free law enforcement agency. And that's essentially what the purpose of that whole interview was. But I decided not to do that interview because, you know, everyone else is covering it. So instead of covering that Joe Rogan interview, I decided that I would instead cover a Joe Rogan interview from 2019, an interview between Joe Rogan and this con artist, Forrest Galantine. Now, this interview was actually brought to my attention well before the Joe Rogan and Mark Zuckerberg interview. And I've been meaning to do this video for quite some time, but I never did. And I'm actually very happy that I didn't because the video that I was originally going to be doing on this interview was really only going to be focusing on one thing. It wasn't going to be focusing on the creation of a shill. It was just going to be focusing on the totally false information that's shared in this interview. Basically, I was going to go over this clip that actually my father shared with me. My father came across a short that was taken from this interview, and he was like, wow, this information that they're giving here is not only wrong, but it's incredibly deceptive. And I was basically going to do a video showing how they were wrong and how they were deceiving the audience. But I never did. So anyway, let me get right into it. I'm sure this introduction is already too long and already too goofy and clumsy. So actually, I'm sorry, I want to say one more thing before I get into the clip. And that is I want to say something about this guy, Forrest Galantine. And that is that this guy, Forrest Galantine, he's basically the bootleg shill crocodile hunter. And I'm going to be showing exactly why in a moment. But that's how I'm going to label him right now at the start of the video. This guy, massive, massive con artist in my opinion. And I'll be explaining his con. Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll explain it momentarily. Okay, so, so let's look at this guy, right? Or actually, let's look at this clip. Let's get right into it. So get this. Chubacabra has been attributed to the possibility that there are thylacine in North America. And here's what supports that. There is documented proof. Okay, um, I just want to say a thylacine is a Tasmanian tiger, for those of you who don't know. So let's get right back to the video. Documented proof that however many years ago, I don't remember the dates. Okay, right there, I just have to say there's a reason why he's claiming to not remember the dates. And I'll show you exactly why he has to claim to not remember the dates. So let's, let's let this play. There were two breeding pair of thylacine bound for the Bronx Zoo. And they, the boat crashed into the shore. Okay, he says into the shore, but into the shore where? There's a huge shoreline along the eastern side of the United States. So where did this boat crash? What shore of what state? He doesn't give that information because he's a con man. And most of the animals escaped, including the two breeding pair of thylacine. Fast forward 10, 15 years, you start having these chubacabra sightings pop up in the Northeast. Okay, so fast forward 10 or 15 years, right? So he claims there are these two pair of breeding Tasmanian tigers. They were put onto a ship and sent over to the Bronx Zoo, right? And then he's claiming that it crashed, and then 10 or 15 years later, 
you start to have sightings of the chupacabra. Okay, there's only one problem with this. Okay, so the last thylacine, the last Tasmanian tiger, was in 1936. Okay, this was the last known thylacine. It died in a zoo due to exposure. Okay, they had it in a really shitty um, cage. It wasn't meant to be in that cage, and it basically died due to exposure to the elements. These people, if you ask me, it, it seems like they intentionally killed it. But that is neither here or there. Okay, so this was in 1936. Okay, so the first Chupacabra sightings was in 1995. And he doesn't specify the coastline because the sightings were first reported in Puerto Rico. Actually, there's some confusion here. There are some sightings that go back to like uh, the 1970s, like 1975. And these sightings occurred simultaneously in Texas and Puerto Rico. And that's something that I might talk about at the end of this video. So this jackass right here, he's all like, not only did these breeding pair of thylacine, it had to happen before this, right? Because this is the, the last known thylacine was in 1936. So if they had a breeding pair of thylacine, it's like, why the hell would they put it on a boat, a ship, send it from Tasmania to the Bronx Zoo? That's like on the other side of the world. That is like literally the farthest away that you could probably get from Tasmania by boat. Okay, so they put these delicate animals, these breeding pair of these delicate animals on this boat. It crashes. And these are delicate animals, okay? They died from exposure being in a zoo, not even being wet or anything like that. He claims that these animals, the boat crashes, these animals managed to escape from whatever cage they were in or, wh or whatever kennel they were in, however they were contained on the ship. They managed to escape their enclosures, go through the water, go into the shore, and not only live, but they actually managed to breed with each other for decades, Actually, well, according to him, 10 to 15 years later, they actually, they, they must have also slipped into a time warp somehow and then jumped to the year 1995. So you, th you, see, so you see, this is why he can't give the dates over here. However many years ago, I don't remember the date. I don't remember the dates. However many years ago, it's, it's a total con. And he says it with the utmost confidence. Let me see where Fast am I? Fast forward 10, 15 okay. years. Okay, yeah, let's, let's go to here. Uh, is it here? Okay, yeah, yeah. But it gets better. So this shows that he's a con man, right? And by the way, just look at this face. Look at those senpaku eyes. The eyes of a true psychotic. But anyway, not only is he just totally lying about that, check this shit out right here. And these animals were adapted to living in Tasmania, which is a pretty similar climate to the North America and Northeast. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so check this out. So he's like, yeah, they were adapted to surviving in Tasmania. And he claims that Tasmania has a similar climate to the northeastern United States or northeast of North America. I don't know where. He doesn't give any exact areas. But the northeast, the Bronx Zoo, is in the northeastern United States, right? So let's look at this. So Tasmania climate, right? In Tasmania, the summers are comfortable. The winters are cold and windy. And it is partly cloudy year-round. Over the course of the year... The temperature typically varies from 42 degrees Fahrenheit to 71 degrees Fahrenheit and is rarely below 36 degrees Fahrenheit or above 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, this is the climate of Tasmania. Now let's look at the climate of the northeastern United States. The northeast is characterized by fairly diverse climate with bitterly cold winters that often bring extreme weather in the form of ice storms and snowstorms and semi-humid summers, especially to the south. Average temperature during winter often dip below zero degrees Fahrenheit. So this guy, he doesn't even know that the climate in Tasmania is nothing like the climate in the northeastern United States. And the reason that this is important is because the Tasmanian tiger, or these thylacines, wouldn't be able to survive anywhere in the United States. The weather conditions are just too harsh. Remember, this is an animal that died while in captivity in a zoo in Tasmania. In, like a, sim in a climate that it was adjusted to. All of these other climates here in the United States, the south is just way too hot. Like anywhere in the south, just way too hot. Especially Texas, which is one of the places that 
reported supposed um, chupacabra-like attacks on animals, Texas in the 1970s and Puerto Rico also in the 1970s had chupacabra-like attacks that I might talk about at the end of this video. I don't think I am because it's going to be way too long of a video. But these places that had these early supposed chupacabra attacks, you know, a thylacine wouldn't be able to survive in these climates. Nowhere in the United States, maybe in like the extreme northwest, like the Oregon coast sort of, where um, it's kind of like warm for most of the year, like it has like a tropical effect over there, but nowhere else in the United States. Now, the reason why he probably wants people to think that there are thylacines in the United States has to do with his con. I'm just going to kind of jump ahead here real quick and say that part of his con, he claims that he wants to hunt thylacines. And, like, apparently he's already, like, taken two trips to Tasmania to hunt for these thylacines or whatever. So because this is part of his con, because he receives funding to to look for these supposedly extinct animals, if he can convince people that there are possibly thylacines in the United States, then he can basically get paid for not even leaving the United States. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm hunting these thylacines here in the United States. And for budgetary reasons for his whole scheme and stuff, it makes sense. It could save him money in the long run. But that's just one theory that I have. Let's see what else this uh, con artist has to say. And so uh, there's people that have kind of drawn these parallels and said, oh, the chubacabra that we've reported running around, you know, the United States is actually a tiny remnant population of the thylacine that were brought here for the Bronx Zoo that escaped. What? What? I love Joe Rogan. He's so stupid. Joe Rogan's like, what? And Joe Rogan, I mean, I could say a lot about him, but I've already done videos exposing Joe Rogan. This guy has had CIA agents on his show. This guy has had people who lie about climate change on his show. And he also has confidence men like this guy and Mark Zuckerberg on his show. I mean, Joe Rogan, it's just, he's just awful. But the club did a very good job at making him a cult figure in the popular culture. Like the club, people don't even realize this, but the club builds these people up. Now let me show you how they built up this guy, Forrest Galantine, this total freaking confidence man with his senpaku eyes. I mean, just look at this guy. Complete psychotic, okay? Total liar, compulsive liar, actually. Pathological liar, so. Actually, like I've watched um, more of this interview because after I saw this short, I was like, you know what, let me watch more of that interview. And Jesus Christ, it's like this guy cannot help but lie. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, wait a second, I have a funny story about that. And then that funny story is like clearly a lie. And it's like, damn dude, you're just super cringy. And you know what, I'll actually start by proving him a pathological liar. So of course I've noticed some things in the interview which to me I just believe are lies. Like I just don't buy what he's selling. But let's look at his documented lies. So if you go to his Wikipedia and you look at the criticism section, you'll find the following. As host of the Extinct or Alive series, Galantine has been seen negatively by ecologists for being a parachute scientist. Galantine has also claimed that he personally rediscovered the Fernandina Island tortoise and the Rio Apoporus caiman. Both claims which have been contradicted by the leaders of their respective expeditions, the latter of which published their findings and exploration prior to Galantine's trip to Colombia. Check that out. Galantine has not outlined his claimed discoveries in any scientific journals. Washington Tapia Agorilla, a biologist at the Galapagos Conservancy and director of the Giant Tortoise Restoration Initiative, also disputes Galanti's claims, saying he, not Galanti, actually decided where to look for the tortoise and that Ecuadorian park ranger Jeffrey Malaga was the one that knew the land, tracked the tortoise, and ultimately made the discovery before calling over the rest of the team. So check this out. This guy just... This one is, is my favorite, though. The, the, for, the, for the Cayman, for the Rio Apoporus Cayman. The dude claimed that he personally rediscovered this Cayman even though the findings and explorations were all published before he even went to Colombia. 
Like, dude, you got to be a serious confidence man. I mean, you got to have like the craziest amount of confidence to be making these claims, which can be empirically and demonstrably proven to be lies. Like, just amazing. This guy, I got to hand it to him. So let's see how the club built up this guy, okay? Let's look at how his career started. In 2013, Galantine made his first four-way into television with an appearance on the Discovery Channel's Naked and Afraid, where he participated in the show's 21-day survival challenge. He completed the challenge, being dropped with a stranger in the remote section of northwestern Panama, and scored one of the highest PSR, primitive survival ratings, in the show's history. Okay, so right off the bat, everyone should know this show, it's a television show. This is an actual survival show. These people aren't actually out there alone for 21 days surviving on their own. Okay, this is a complete, it's fiction. Okay, it, it, it's a show. So they use this show to build up the guy's credit. They're like, yeah, man, look at this guy. He's the greatest survivor in our show's history. He knows the wilderness. He's this great guy. Okay, so then in 2016, Galantine and his photographer were among the first to ever swim with crocodiles, wearing special suits that mimic the crocodile's scaly skin and block the body's electrical current. So I'm just going to stop. Okay? I'm not going to read all of this. Right off the bat, they use very tricky language here. So here, if you notice, they say they were among the first. Among the first does not mean that they were the first. But you see, this is what they have to do with their confidence men. They have to make them out to be like groundbreakers. They have to make them out to be these really great people, these really smart people who push the fold, who are not afraid to get into the face of crocodiles. They're fearless. You know, so this is all part of the creating of the popular shill. On June 10th, 2018, Galantine's docuseries, Extinct or Alive. Yeah, by the way, this guy, he went from having the, like the highest rating in the show to basically becoming a producer on the animal planet. He has his own shows and everything, okay? And this is like in a five-year period. He makes this huge name for himself. So he has his own docu-series, Extinct or Alive, on the animal planet. The show sought to reveal whether animals believed to be extinct can potentially still be found. In each episode, Galantine explored the habitats of these animals, often seeking protection to help preserve the species and encourage their continued survival. Destinations have included Taiwan and all these other places. Galantine has stated that he is committed to uncovering the thylacine and after two expeditions will continue searching. Okay, I just want to cover this whole con that's going on here. See, this is a brilliant con because it's like, hey, look, I'm going out to find these supposedly extinct animals. Now, of course, this has like this element of adventure and mystery and it has a lot of exciting and romantic things about it. Like just this idea of going and finding and looking for these extinct animals, okay? So that's one element of this con. The next element of this con is that when they find these extinct animals, they can now ask governments and they can ask charity foundations, which I'm sure are mostly corrupt, just like the governments. They can ask these people to then give them money. And it's like, yes, give me money to help conserve these animals. So that's really the purpose of this con. It's really just a massive money-making operation that makes the con artist look like a sweetheart. It's like, yeah, no, he's not a con artist. He actually, he's a caring person. He's a loving, caring person that you should trust. So let's fast forward. Let's look ahead. Now, of course, he was on uh, Shark Week, the Today Show, the Joe Rogan Experience, which is what we're going to be looking at. But interesting, check this out. In 2019, he appeared on 24 episodes of Nature's Strangest Mysteries, Solve, and testified in front of the United States Congress to promote legislator change and increase funding for conservation. See, there you go. Increase funding for him. Because remember, his whole thing is basically... He wants to conserve the supposedly extinct creatures. So not only does he have this whole con going, but then he actually even went in front of Congress to ask for more funding for conservation, and that funding will, of course, end up in his pockets. Now, here is the really funny part. In 2020, and by the way, around here, around 2019, this is when he was on the Joe Rogan Experience. So he was on the Joe Rogan Experience pushing this thylacine lie and all of this fucking totally false information right around the same time. And that's why Joe Rogan 
probably had to have him on his show to kind of give him more credit. And it's like, yeah, you know, we have to we have to boost this guy's name even more. So check this out. In 2020, Galantine hosted a limited edition television series named Wet Markets Exposed on Vice TV. Wet markets that sell live animals for human consumption, which can be sick, inbred, or endangered, can facilitate the transfer of disease to humans. In the series, Galantine discusses how the mistreatment and illegal selling and consumption of these animals allows the transfer of zoonotic viruses to humans. Basically, the whole COVID wet market lie. So if this doesn't expose him as a club member who spreads the club's propaganda, then I don't know what else to tell you. Let's look at what else is here, right? So in an interview in 2021, Galantine was nicknamed the Indiana Jones of biology. And you see, this is actually what they've been doing. If you look at his career, they've been trying to make him into this Indiana Jones of biology. And it's all, it's all for the masses. It's all for this, for this creation of a popular shill. And then, of course, he has this, uh, this book that he published in uh, 2021. I'm sure that somebody else wrote it for him. But he publishes this book, and the publisher describes it as part memoir and part biological adventure. All right, so now I'm going to give my take on the chupacabra, what I think really happened. And actually, it ties in perfectly to what this confidence man is doing. It's actually exactly what this confidence man is doing. At least, it's not all of what he's doing, but it's one aspect of what this confidence man is doing. So here's what I think is the truth about the chupacabra. I think that it's a psychological operation that it has many facets in and of itself, but one of its facets is to gauge the intelligence of the population, to see, okay, how capable is the population of discerning fact from fiction? And when they see that a significant enough of the population is just not capable of discerning fact from fiction, they, uh, they might make some moves. Or at least something along those lines. Okay, it's something in that ballpark. So as I already had mentioned, um, you know, we have the Chupacabra sightings that began in 1995 in Puerto Rico. But earlier than that, we had Chupacabra sightings, or at least Chupacabra-like attacks on animals in Texas. So I found this, uh, this Chupacabra timeline, and for some reason... I think it was on, like, princeton.edu. It was, it was a weird URL. I found it weird that it was a .edu URL. But whatever. I found this uh, timeline. And, uh, you know, here it mentions, like, there was this attack in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas. And, um, you know, there was uh, a condor-like creature that was sighted. And what's, what's interesting is that this condor-like creature actually matches the condor-like creature that is claimed to have been sighted in Puerto Rico, which I will get into in a second linked to a rash of cattle mutilations, and in these cases, um, blood was removed to the last drop, according to these people. And then there was uh, Brownsville, Texas, where a rancher finds a bull dead, and no blood around it, no tracks. Maybe possibly vampire bats. But what this timeline doesn't include is this event that happened in Puerto Rico, which my father actually experienced firsthand because it occurred in his town in Puerto Rico, the Vampire of Mocha. Now, the Vampire of Mocha, if you look into it, um, this is how they described it. And as you see, it, uh, it matches a lot of Chupacabra sightings. So anyway, let's, let's read this a little bit, okay? So, coinciding with the overwhelming number of cattle mutilations occurring in the United States and in the rest of the world at that time, Puerto Ricans discovered that their livestock was being slain by a mysterious unseen assailant. They would have been more distressed to learn that the same situation would replay itself 20 years later, courtesy of the ubiquitous Chupacabra. So in February of 1975, a Puerto Rican newspaper ran one of the very first headlines concerning the wave of mysterious animal deaths to occur in the vicinity of the small town of Mocha on the island's western side. Now, this is Mocha, and uh, Mocha, it's a very underdeveloped town, especially at that time, 
it was severely underdeveloped. And there's a couple of reasons why uh, Mocha is so underdeveloped. Um, one of the main reasons is that it's very hilly. So if we look at Mocha, you see there's a lot of hills in Mocha. And these hills, actually a lot of them, especially when you go further east, they actually cut Mocha off from a lot of other parts of the island. So because of this, mostly uh, the center part of Puerto Rico and the eastern part of Puerto Rico were developed. I believe uh, San Juan is in the center part-ish of Puerto Rico. But uh, because of that, um, Mocha is a very isolated and underdeveloped place, and basically the perfect place to pull off a hoax. So the personal story that I'll share with you guys. So my father is from this town, and he was alive during this time. And he said that this story relating to the Mocha vampire, which, uh, as you see... It, it first ran in the newspapers, which is really important because that has to do with my whole theory. But anyway, my father said that during this time, there was just like mass hysteria in the town. Like everybody believed this story to the point where people would form mobs at nighttime to go hunt for this supposed vampire. They were going around hunting for this vampire. There's a lot of caves in this town because of all the mountains. So uh, they were even blowing up the entrances of caves. I mean, total, complete hysteria. So, um, when my father told me this story, I immediately suspected that it was a mass psychological operation that was occurring at the time. As you see, it didn't just occur in Puerto Rico or Texas. It was also occurring in the rest of the world at the time. And I think that this was a psychological operation to do a couple of things. I think it was to test the population. I think it was to... Uh, to maybe do other things that I'm not even going to get into. But what's interesting is that at this time, if you look into it, the CIA was actually very, very active in Puerto Rico. And, you know, there's this video that I managed to find when I was looking for, like, CIA activity in Puerto Rico. So this video exists on YouTube, and it's from basically this socialist who was in Puerto Rico at the time. And he gave this speech at this conference that occurred at Yale University. Of course, I think we all know who is connected with Yale University, right? Is that where Skull and Bones is at? Yale? It is, right? Okay. So anyway, so um, this guy gave this speech at Yale University. He was a socialist, and he was talking about like how the CIA needs to do more in Puerto Rico. So the CIA was active in Puerto Rico, and check this out. This is the same exact year that this whole Vampira de Moca thing was happening, okay, 1975. So, um, not only that, not only was the CIA active in Puerto Rico, but the Navy and the military were actively testing weapons on the eastern side of the island in the 1970s. So, they were testing specifically on this island. But it's very possible that they were testing, like, physical military weapons over here, and then doing some psychological tests over here. And, of course, I think... I think we all know that uh, Puerto Rico also has that, like, giant satellite. I, I don't know when that um, radio satellite was put in. I know that that uh, radio satellite's no longer used because it was damaged. But it would be interesting to know when that satellite was put in. But, um, or, or, or telescope, I'm sorry, it's not a, a, a satellite. It's a, it's a radio telescope. So, yeah, Puerto Rico has that, like, it was the world's largest radio telescope. So it would be interesting to know when that was put in. But, um... Yeah, so, so what I think happened, I think that the Chupacabra was just simply a massive psychological operation that was happening at the time. It was seeing how the government could generate hysteria and to see how easy they could manipulate the minds of the masses. Now, one of the last interesting things that I want to mention here is the possible effect that Hollywood had here. Now, when I was first investigating possibilities for all of this, I thought, hey, maybe what happened was some prankster saw some vampire movie or had some vampire influence, and then that prankster decided to carry out these pranks. And, you know, this seems like a, a typical thing to happen in Puerto Rico, especially this part of Puerto Rico, because a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans in this part of Puerto Rico are pranksters. And I know this because, once again, my family's from this part of Puerto Rico. I'm not saying that I'm a prankster. But I'm just saying that I'm familiar with the people in this area. And pulling pranks on people is pretty common 
for this part of the area. Not just pulling pranks, but also exaggerating things and kind of, uh, you also have like liars in this area. So I thought, hey, maybe they were influenced by a vampire film at the time. And, uh, you know, so I decided to check out vampire films. Now, of course, um, I don't think that this uh, works because of how prevalent these attacks were. You know, these attacks or these uh, events were clearly, they clearly happened around the same time. Like, it was clearly coordinated. There was some coordination going on in the media and uh, behind the scenes. Whether these stories are completely made up, because, I mean, that could be a thing. Like, these stories can be completely made up. Like, almost all of the details about them can be complete fabrications, and they could have just taken pictures from staged events. You know, this is totally possible. So, what's interesting, though, is that when you come over and you look at all of the vampire films that came out, you do have a lot of vampire films that came out just before uh, The Vampire of Mocha, just before the 1975 incident. So, here in the United Kingdom, you have this list, right? This is all, I guess, from, like, the same Dracula series. Then you have 58, 60, 66, 68, 70, 70, 1972, 73, 1974. And at the same time that all of these are coming out in the United Kingdom, you have uh, these movies, um, you know, Batman Dracula, 64, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula, 1966, Batman Fights Dracula, 1967, uh, Vampire, 1968, this is United Kingdom, Dracula, uh, Blood of Dracula's Castle, uh, Count Dracula, uh, and what's interesting, this one, uh, Spain, Italy, West Germany, United Kingdom. So Spain here, this film coming out in Spanish, it disseminates throughout uh, more of the world. So then this one uh, called Jonathan, which is interesting. I kind of want to watch this just because uh, it has a different name. So um, then Count Dracula, 71. And then uh, Vampiro uh, Lesbos. What is this like? It's like some kind of porn flick. I don't know, like some softcore porn vampire film. Um, uh, West Germany. Yeah, yeah, look at that. West Germany, Spain. Um, Dracula versus Frankenstein, 1971. Uh, Blackula. And what's interesting, Blackula, my father saw this with his father in Puerto Rico. I think it was in Puerto Rico or it could have been when he was visiting him in in uh, the States. I don't know where they saw it, but he did see this with his father at the time. And I imagine that they saw like some sort of uh, Spanish translation of it or at least some sort of like Spanish subtitled version of it. So Blackula um, and then this other one, um, Scream, Blackula, Scream, I guess this is... Uh, the sequel, 73. Uh, 73 again, The Devil's Wedding Night. Um, and then I guess this was also, uh, yeah, this is Italian. Um, Dracula, uh, Canada. Um, then Count Dracula's Great Love. And then this was uh, from in Spain. Um, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Uh, Blood for Dracula. And then 75, they took a break. So, so check that out. There were a lot of Dracula flicks that came out in the 70s. Now, we have to ask ourselves, did this just influence pranksters all over the world? Did pranksters all over the world just simultaneously decide to pull the same prank? And the same, like, completely horrific prank. Like, some of these reports and what was done to some of these animals is just completely horrifying. So, did, like, these movies just all of a sudden influence, like, you know, crazy people to do crazy things? Or was there a psychological operation that not only was the news media involved with, but the entertainment media was also involved with? Was this like a, a massive operation that involved the government, the news, and the entertainment industry? Is this possible? I think that that is exactly what happened. You! Ah! Why'd you do this to me? Why? For... for money. 